Welcome everyone, and thank you for joining today's onboard limited release question and answer session for payers. Please keep your phone lines muted. We will be taking your questions through the chat box. When sending your questions in the chat box, send them to all panelists. Today we are joined by project leadership and subject matter experts from various areas of the Workers' Compensation Board. To begin, let's review the most common questions we have received so far from payers with Ryan from the Board's Public Information Office. Thanks, Mike. First question, who can submit what in Onboard? Available on the Medical Portal web pages, there is a chart that labels what submissions certain provider types can make. For example, all provider types listed can submit a request for decision on unpaid medical bills, Form HP 1.0, non-MTGs under or equal to $1,000, and non-MTGs over $1,000. What is the required time frame for a PAR response or PAR responses? Response requirements vary for certain PAR types. Responses for MTG confirmation are required within eight business days. MTG variants and MTG special services responses are required within 15 calendar days, but the response time is extended to 30 days if an IME is requested. Non-MTG over $1,000 responses are required within 30 calendar days. Non-MTG under or equal to $1,000 responses are required within eight business days. And medication and durable medical equipment responses are due within four calendar days. Can medical suppliers submit PARs? No, medical suppliers can only submit a request for decision on unpaid medical bills, form HP 1.0 in Onboard. What should we do if we receive a paper request? Payer responses to C4 auth MG1 and MG2 forms submitted prior to May 2nd, 2022 will continue to follow the process used prior to onboard limited release. If payers receive a paper form, they should advise the requesting healthcare provider that submissions need to be done in onboard. Will an order of the chair generate a document in Onboard? Yes. The form name will be PAR, then the PAR type, order of the chair. You can download or print the document directly in the document section, or you can select the document ID to view the order of the chair in Onboard. Do administrative denials automatically escalate to level two? If all items on a PAR are denied administratively or granted, then the PAR will not auto escalate. If any item is denied for medical reasons or granted in part, then the entire PAR will auto escalate. What can a payer do if a PAR is for a body part or condition that has not been accepted or established? If the payer does not wish to grant the PAR, then they have two options, grant without prejudice or deny with a medical rationale. Unless the claim is currently controverted, both of these actions must be completed by the level two reviewer.
What can a payer do if they receive a PAR for a response that is not for their claim? If the payer believes that they have received a submission that is not their claim, the payer should controvert the claim and then deny the PAR on that basis. If the payer does not dispute their liability, but argues that a different TPA is handling the case, they can either coordinate with the payer and or the other TPA to respond or fail to respond and allow an OOTC to be generated. Timely first and subsequent report of injury filings will ensure PARs are routed to the correct payer. If an IME is being obtained, must the PAR be denied on the portal first and noted to be pending an IME? No, you will not provide a response to that PAR until the IME has been conducted to assist in rendering a decision. Payers will need to send the IME requested notification in onboard. When sending the IME requested notification, the PAR response due date will be extended to 30 days. If denying for medical reasons, can you check off more than one if multiple reasons apply? Yes. After selecting deny and medical reasons, all medical reason options will appear for selection. You can select as many as applicable, including other, which will then open a text field for the other medical reason to be entered. Is the provider required to add a medical report as part of their PAR submission? Yes, every PAR submission in onboard requires the healthcare provider to enter a statement of medical necessity into a text box and or upload a statement of medical necessity or supporting medical documentation. For the remainder of today's webinar, we will answer questions submitted via chat, so I will turn it back over to Mike. Thank you, Ryan. As a reminder, please send your questions to all panelists in the chat box. We'll take a brief moment now to review the questions submitted, and we will be back shortly. Um, the first, this is James Russell with the Board's Claims Operations Division. Our first question is about how payer claim administrators should handle PARs where they are no longer the claim administrator, and that really is a determination to be made by the claim administrator. There's no denial reason that you are not the administrator. If you're not the carrier and you've controverted the claim, you could deny on the basis that you've controverted the claim. If you were the TPA handling the claim and you're not anymore, it's really up to you whether you choose to coordinate with the correct TPA or the current TPA and carrier to submit a response or uh, don't respond and let it go to order of the chair. Um, the second question we have is about attaching information to a PAR submission. And there are both, the example given is apportionment. Um, there are fields in the payer response to put in apportionment information. And then there are prompts at the end of the response where the payer can choose to attach supporting documentation. This is, this is Jim Tachi, the board's medical director. There's a question. What should be the appropriate response if further requested information is not received within stated time frame for a PAR MTG confirmation or MTG variance? Um, and the answer is if the, if the required uh, you know, medical documentation or substantiation and additional information that you, you requested is not received, uh, you simply uh, deny the PAR. 
and you can state that uh, in your comments back as to why the power was denied. Hi, this is Paula. I'm in the medical director's office. Um, we were having some questions on getting MTG confirmation requests on treatment that um, reviewers feel should have been submitted as a variance. It's important to understand that you would have to respond. The, the provider may think that it is a confirmation and the reviewer would be responsible for determining whether you agree with that as the correct application of the guidelines. If you do not, then it would have to be denied and go to a level two reviewer who would then be able to deny it for medical rationale. Uh, another question, how do we handle PT requests without frequency or duration? Um, what we are recommending is that providers include frequency and duration in the medical necessity field when they're requesting the PAR and also asking them to include it in their supporting documentation. When you as the payer are responding to the request, um, you can also enter what you're actually approving. Um, so, for example, if they ask for three times a week for four weeks and you wanted to grant in part and give them two times a week for four weeks, you could just note that somewhere within the one of the empty fields. So there's a couple questions about the auto escalation from level one to level two. Um, first of all, is a level one denial required? Uh, and the answer to that is yes, all PARs go to level one, and it's only if the response from level one, the proposed response from level one requires L2 to be the responder that it automatically escalates to level two. But all requests do go to L1 first. There's no automatic routing directly to level two. Um, and that even if the denial is going to reference an IME, it's ultimately the carrier physician responsibility to make that denial, which is why that must occur at level two. And um, just to be clear, all responses that go back to the provider are memorialized in eCase as a document. So if I, as a level one reviewer, grant a request, my level one response will be visible in eCase. If I, as level one, propose to deny a PAR for medical reasons and it auto escalates to level two, my L1 response won't appear in eCase because that response didn't go back to the provider. It'll only be the level two response that appears in eCase. Hi, this is Audrey Cunningham from the Medical Director's Office. Uh, there are a few questions with respect to what is considered an administrative denial um, in on board. Um, so an administrative denial, um, there are several instances that on board uh, specifies as an administrative, meaning that a denial can take place without uh, the review carrier physician's review. Um, those are instances, uh, section 32, if a case is a dis disallowed or canceled. Uh, also, um, there are IME-related re instances where a denial can take place without the review of a carrier's physician, um, including a, um, a claimant not uh, showing for an IME. Uh, there's a question about uh, disputing further medical treatment based on an IME report or a failure to appear for an IME. That is not an onboard limited release function. Uh, the current form to raise that issue would be Part A of Form C8.1, um, but that request has also been added to the latest version of Form RFA2 because we expect that uh, the Part A of Form C8.1 is going to be obsolete sometime in the early fall. So you would raise that through the adjudication process using one of those two forms, but not through onboard limited release. Hi, this is Paula Rausch from the Medical Director's Office. Uh, we received a question that states, we received an MCG confirmation PAR for a knee arthroscopy with a meniscectomy. 
The problem is that this is not within the guidelines and should have come through on the MTG variance request par. Um, this seems to be an administrative denial, but there's no denial provided to carriers that aligns to this type of denial. So th this would not be an administrative denial because again, the provider may feel that it did meet the criteria and the guidelines. Um, and when asked the question of whether it was consistent with the guidelines or not consistent with the guidelines, if they answered that it was consistent, that's their PAR request. As the carrier, you would be required to review it for medical necessity. And if you felt that it did not meet the criteria in the guidelines, then that is one of the reasons that the level two physician reviewer would be able to respond. Um, uh, th there's a question as to whether um, a confirmation PAR uh, is sufficient or should be submitted for a service that is on the list of special services requiring a special services par. Uh, and the answer is that uh, anything on the list of special services requiring a special services par has to be submitted as such for a, spe as a special services par. I presume even if it's uh, consistent with the medical treatment guidelines, et cetera, it still requires a special services par. There's a question asking if the system chooses the PAR type or if the provider picks the PAR type. The system automatically routes to the correct PAR type based on the responses to the questions the provider has asked. And then there's a question about the edits in place when the provider is completing the PAR to ensure they've attached the appropriate documentation and met the burden of proof. There are required questions for the provider to answer, and they may either attach documents or explain their rationale for why the treatment is necessary and appropriate. It, and the system will enforce that the provider has answered all of those questions. It's then up to the payer's reviewer to determine if they're going to grant or deny the request based on the information provided. Uh, we have a question about the notification that an IME is needed on a variance or special services PAR, and that notification in onboard only goes to the provider. So just like your responses, if you are making that notification, it is the payer's responsibility to send that document to the claimant, injured worker and their attorney. And then related to the, uh, that question about IMEs is what payers should do if there's already an IME scheduled and it's within the 30-day window. If, you're submit, if it's a variance or special services PAR, onboard limited release gives you 15 days to respond unless you notify the parties that there is an IME. So if you receive a PAR today and you have an IME in 22 days, you need to perform the notification function in OBLR. Otherwise, onboard is going to generate an order of the chair after 15 days because you didn't respond within the time frame that it thinks you have to respond. There's a question asking if a copy of this presentation will be available on the board's website. And yes, as a follow-up to this webinar this week, we will send an email that will contain a recording of today's webinar and a copy of the slides presented, and it will be available um, on the payers onboard webpage under resources. How can a payer indicate that they have a DME contract vendor and need for it to be processed there? Um, so all DME PAR requests, if the carrier is not approving it as requested, um, they will have the opportunity and actually are required to put in two alternate sources and contacts where the item can be obtained. So if you are approving it and it's a lower price and you want them to use your vendor because it's a lower price, you, you would at that time be able to identify it. Uh, there's a question if it's a confirmation bar for an injection and it's denied both at level one and level two, uh, should the provider then file a variance? Uh, this seems duplicative. Uh, so the, the provider has the option within uh, OBLR to convert their confirmation PAR uh, to a variance PAR. So they don't have to 
create a whole new par, they can convert their existing par to a variance par. Uh, we have a question about referencing a Froy or Schroy 04 when you're denying or granting a par without prejudice because the claim is currently controverted. Uh, to clarify, the, the board doesn't expect that if you received a par, you would controvert the case on the basis that you received the par. You would have already, or maybe receiving the par is what prompts you to look at the case, but presumably there's another reason employer-employee relationship or not providing coverage or something about the accident, that's your actual basis for controverting the case. Um, we have a question about uh, how a payer might respond when a worker has been deemed uh, to have reached maximum medical improvement, but there's uh, no board decision memorializing that. Um, if there is no, if none of the administrative reasons apply, please do not select one of those reasons. The fact that the claimant is MMI, you shouldn't select like that there was a section 32 because that's not actually what happened. Or if you, if there's an O2 indicating that, you shouldn't put in that the case was currently controverted and reference the O2 as if it's an O4. If there is no administrative reason to deny the PAR, then the only recourse if the carrier is looking to deny the PAR is to do so for medical reasons with a rationale. There's a question about if the IME cannot be scheduled until after the 30 days. Uh, unfortunately, the response will still be due within that 30 days. Um, so while you could have the IME to opine, it would not be relevant to the response that you are providing. Uh, there's also a question on whether or not there's a deadline to submit a PAR. For example, the PAR is submitted today, but the supporting medical is more than 30 days old. If so, can we deny based on old medical? This is not a hard and fast rule. Uh, you'd have to take a look at what the actual request was and what the medical was. So for example, if they were looking for something like a surgery and the MRI was two months old, that, that would not be considered, normally would not be considered too old to review the request. So you really have to take it on a case-by-case -case basis. Hi, we have a, a question about granting without prejudice. If you have a request for a body part that has not been accepted or established and it's assigned to the level one reviewer and they wish to grant without prejudice for that reason, the system, the way to accomplish that in the system would be for the level one reviewer to propose to deny it for medical reasons, which will then trigger an escalation to level two. The level two reviewer can grant without prejudice on that basis. The level one reviewer doesn't have access to grant without prejudice on the basis that the body part has not been accepted or established. There's a question, why aren't providers required to enter a quantity such as PT, OT, et cetera? Uh, as we mentioned earlier, we are encouraging providers uh, to put uh, e either in their uh, documentation uh, that they upload or into their comments, uh, the frequency and duration of the services that they're requesting. There's a question on how to register for onboard uh, for providers. You would visit the medical portal icon under popular services on the board website. You'll then be on the medical portal overview page. If you're a provider, you'll select access and administration under providers. You'll want to scroll down to the sign up button and complete the registration. Once that registration is completed within one to two business days, that provider will be sent a user ID and password at the email on that registration. If you're a payer, you have to speak with your online administrator. There is no registration for a payer. Again, you have to speak to your online user administrator for the medical portal, and they would need to add you as either the workload admin, online user admin, or a reviewer, depending on what role you have within that organization. Hi, there's a question uh, with respect to the response time for DME requests. It is not five days, it is four days. The responses to DME requests are four days. 
Okay. If, a body, okay. if a body part is not established and the claim is not controverted, how should the employer or the carrier respond? Uh, that's up to the carrier. There's no L1 administrative reason that could be used to deny the PAR. So the PAR is going to end up, unless you're granting it, which you certainly have the option to do, the PAR is going to end up at level two, and then the level two reviewer has the option to either grant without prejudice or deny with the medical rationale. Now there's a question, are providers responsible for uploading documentation into onboard in order for the level two reviewer to be able to review on documentation needed to make a decision? Uh, and the answer is yes. Uh, the provider is responsible to uh, upload the information or documentation necessary to substantiate their request. Another question, if the payer responds to a request in error, can that response be amended? The answer is no. So please be sure before you submit that the, answer, the response you're submitting is the response you intend to submit. Hi, we have a question regarding apportionment and how the provider knows to submit to the primary carrier. The provider is not selecting the carrier that is be, the claim is being submitted the PAR is being submitted to. The provider is matching to an existing case, and then the PAR is automatically being routed to whom the board has designated as the primary insurer. There's a question about the due date and when a PAR expires. Uh, all are due at the close of day for that specific day. So if it's due on May 10th uh, today, uh, you have till 11.59. Uh, PM Eastern time to respond to that request. Uh, there's a question, what can be done if a provider submits the wrong PAR uh, or doesn't respond to a request for information? Uh, as was noted before, uh, you can uh, deny the PAR and, and give the reason why, and the provider can submit either the correct PAR or should have submitted the, the information requested. Uh, there's a question about frequency and duration for PT and size and locations for injections are missing on PARs. What should the payer do? The payer has the opportunity to request further information from the provider directly through OBLR. Um, you could certainly reach out that way and request the additional information. If you don't receive it and you're not able to approve something because there's insufficient information, then it would have to follow the, the normal process and go to a level two to review for medical necessity and deny. There's a question with respect to the MTG lookup tool. That can be accessed on the board's uh, main website. Um, so it, the link is right there on the board's website. Hi, there's a question about if there's anything to enforce that the provider submits a PAR. Um, there, we've certainly been communicating to providers that use of OBLR to request prior authorization where it's required is mandatory. If the provider has not requested prior authorization when required, that's certainly the basis with which the payer could object to paying the medical bill. There's a question about the uh, upload in uh, the 30 megabyte uh, limit. That limit is per user, the 30 megabytes. So if the provider uploads 29 megabytes, uh, that reviewer responding to the request still has 30 megabytes available to them to uh, upload their response. There's a question about what to do if the claimant does not attend their IME appointment or uh, if the claimant initiates a reschedule and it falls outside the 30-day allowance. Those are both, those are actually the two IME-related scheduling reasons by which a PAR can be denied, and that denial can be done by a level one reviewer. 
Uh, there's a question about why does a granted in part need to be escalated to a level two reviewer? Because if you're not granting it as requested, part of the request is being denied. Therefore, it needs to go to a level two physician reviewer. Uh, there's a question about uh, level three decisions and notifications. Just to be clear, as the payer, you'll get two notifications. One, when, it has been, when the PAR has been escalated to level three by the provider, and a second, when the level three decision is actually issued. I, we, there's a question about the time frame for denial between level one and level two. So if, for example, a DME PAR is denied by the L1 reviewer on day four, how long does the level two reviewer have to complete their review? Uh, they have until 11.59 p.m. Eastern time on that day. The total, the review time, whether it's, you know, depend, which varies per PAR type, is the total review time for level one and level two. Hi, it's Tim Purcell with the board. We have a question regarding will there be tweaks or improvements to the current OBLR in the future, like we have with other uh, online applications like eClaims? And the answer is yes. As we receive feedback, uh, we will, of course, use that feedback to improve the system uh, in the future. Uh, how do you address requests that have already been approved? Is there a way to prevent escalation to a level two duplicate request? Um, if you grant the request, the provider won't be able to escalate it. Or if you deny on an administrative basis, and the basis that would jump out at me would be that the service has already been provided, admin denials cannot be escalated to level two. But if you're denying on uh, any other basis, uh, the provider technically does have the ability to uh, escalate. Uh, there's a question on um, if two PAR types come in, one is a variance and one is post-op DME. DME is due in four calendar days. The variance is being sent for IME, and we need that back before we can determine the DME. Can we deny the DME request pending IME on, re on the related PAR? Um, the answer is yes. We advise payers to deny and advise that the provider should resubmit after the um, surgery PAR uh, has been approved. Uh, we have another question about how and when the carrier is disputing future medical treatment. If the carrier has raised that issue through the adjudication process, they should not ignore the PARs that have been submitted because orders of the chair will be generated. You should continue to deny those PARs if that's what you want to do with the medical rationale that you're uh, using to dispute future medical treatment. There's a question on whether the carrier's level two physician has to be licensed in New York State. Carrier's physician means a physician or physicians licensed by New York State or the appropriate state where the professional practices, um, who is employed or contracted by the insurance carrier, self-insured employer, or third-party administrator, or is employed by a URAC accredited company retained by the insurance carrier, self-insured employer, or third-party administrator through a contract to review prior authorization requests and advise the insurance carrier, self-insured employer, or third-party administrator, and is not employed or contracted by the carrier, self-insured employer, or third-party administrator's recommendation of care network. We have a question about due dates, um, when the due date falls on a weekend or a holiday. So if the PAR response time frame is defined as calendar days in accordance with uh, state general construction law, which is most but not all PAR types, if the due date falls on a weekend or a holiday, the due date moves to the next business day. So, you know, if um, seven or seven's a bad example. If 15 days ends up being a Monday and that Monday is a holiday, the due date is Tuesday. Uh, there's a question about PAR medication notifications. That part, in that PAR type, the responses do not need to be sent to the claimant or their attorney. Uh, there's a question that says it's a formulary question. I've read somewhere that naloxone should be prescribed for all patients taking opioids. 
but naloxone is not listed in the formulary, so is it okay to approve or not? Uh, specifically in the formulary, uh, there's a, a footnote to the special considerations, uh, and it says the following. Uh, the prescriber should consider appropriateness of naloxone when prescribing opioids. The board supports the New York State Department of Health recommendations. After appropriate claimant assessment, if the prescriber's judgment it is appropriate for the claimant to obtain naloxone, the provider should submit a prior authorization request. So, in those instances, based on um, the provider's judgment, if the provider is submitting a prior authorization request, um, naloxone should not be considered non-formulary. You would refer to that, that footnote under the special considerations in the formulary, and it's okay to approve. Hi, we have a question about the IME notification and um, if who can perform that function and the notification that an IME is required um, can be performed by the level one reviewer or the level two reviewer. Um, there's a question asking if you can use IME notification on a DME request to buy time while waiting for the IME on the surgery and the variants to come back. Um, the answer would be no. Uh, DME, you're required to respond in four days, regardless of whether you're getting an IME or not. Um, and there's nowhere on a DME par that allows you to notify or or state, I'm getting an IME on this. So um, the answer to that would be no, you, you would still have to respond to the DME within four days. And one more thing related to IMEs, if there already is an IME report in the file that's recent, the medical rationale that's being provided by level two can refer to that IME. There's not necessarily a requirement that another IME be conducted for a new PAR if one was just done. Uh, there's a question about providers withdrawing PARs, and there is no function in the system for the provider to withdraw a PAR once submitted. So we would strongly recommend that the payer respond to those PARs. There's a question asking if the prior phase one and phase two trainings are available on the website. And yes, they're available in a couple locations on the onboard training web pages for payers, which um, hosts all of the detailed instructions for all the processes within onboard. We've added the webinar trainings to the bottom of that page, and they are all still available in the resources page um, for payers. There's a question, will there be any tweaks to the current OBLR in the future like there has been with e-claims based on feedback? Uh, and the answer is that uh, we view this as a continuous uh, improvement setting. So as we receive feedback and if there are uh, shortcomings noted, we're always looking to, um, to correct and fix those. So yes, there probably will be tweaks in the future based on feedback. Uh, there's a question as to whether or not out-of-state providers need to register to, in order to use Onboard, and the answer is yes. Uh, on Out-of-state providers do, in fact, need to register in order to use the system. Uh, there's a question about how the Level 2 reviewer proceeds if they want to provide a different response than was proposed by the level one reviewer, say the level one reviewer proposed to grant a request in part, but the level two reviewer wants to grant in full. The level two reviewer has the option to put in whatever response they would like, um, regardless of what the L1 reviewer had originally posted. 
So there's a couple of questions about duplicates and substantially similar requests. And there is an edit in Onboard that if the provider has submitted a request for a particular treatment or whatever on a particular claim, and that PAR is still live, either because it's pending with the provider to respond or it's been escalated to level three, or there's, it's within a time frame where it could be escalated, the provider can't submit that exact same request while their first request is live. There's another question with respect to out-of-state providers. Uh, out-of-state providers are, in fact, uh, required to submit any prior authorizations through the onboard system. There was a question asking what the email notification subject lines include. If you navigate to the training webpage where all the resources are available, there's a specific training page which outlines the process of receiving notifications, and within that page, there are email and text message examples, and they outline the information that will be included in the subject numbers. And we are just about at one o'clock here, so we will conclude today's webinar. Thank you all for participating, and we hope today's webinar helped answer questions you had about onboard limited release. If you have any questions that we didn't get to, or you have any following the webinar, you can email onboard at wcb.ny.gov with general questions or call 877-632-4996 for other questions. If you have not already, subscribe to receive WCB notifications, where we will send all information about Onboard. Visit the Onboard webpage for all information and resources available to you, including a copy of today's webinar. At the closing of today, you will be linked to a survey. Your input here is greatly appreciated and will help us plan and improve future sessions and as we update our Onboard resources. Thank you again. Have a wonderful day.